Hello and welcome to Live and Ticking. Unfortunately, your regular host, Fergal McKinney, cannot be here this week. Um, I'm Adam Fletcher, I'm head of BHF Cymru, and I'll be taking you through this edition of Live and Ticking, which is all about personalised medicine. Personalised medicine is the process of tailoring medical decisions and interventions towards an individual person. It's about moving away from a one-size-fits-all approach and instead customising care specifically for individuals. Imagine receiving a more precise diagnosis based on your own unique situation um, or, or even being able to predict and prevent illness in the future. This is the basis for personalised medicine. And by understanding the role that our individual physiology plays, it can help us transform how we think about diagnosis, treatment and healthcare as a whole. We at BHF are currently funding research to help develop personalised medicine for those um, living with and at risk of heart and circulatory diseases. And later in today's session, we will hear from a researcher at the forefront of this work, Professor Nick Mills. We'll also hear from a heart story, Javid Hussain, who will share his personal story of having two heart attacks himself. You can submit questions to all our speakers through the Q&A function throughout the talks. And we will also be joined by senior cardiac nurse, Regina Giblin, for questions at the end. And we'll try and answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A at the end. If we're unable to answer any of your questions today, then you can call our heart helpline and speak to one of our cardiac nurses directly. You can also join our Health Unlocked community forum for support. This forum provides a safe space to discuss living with any heart or circulatory disease. So I'd encourage you to look up the Health Unlocked community. And finally, before we hear from our speakers, I'd just like to ask you a quick question. Um, so please take part in this poll. How would you rate your understanding of personalised medicine on a scale of one to five? So one, having very little understanding of personalised medicine, or five, having a lot of understanding of personalised medicine? Please go ahead and answer that question. How would you rate your understanding of personalised medicine? Great, thank you to everyone who's answered that. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, Javid Hussain. Javid suffered uh, his first heart attack in 2016, and then again in 2018. And Javid will talk through his experience with Yana Theodoru from the research engagement team at BHF. Welcome Javid and Yana. Hi, thanks Adam. Hi Javed, welcome. Hi, hi Anna, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your story with us today. You're welcome. So to start us off, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and your, you've got an interesting connection to the BHF, haven't you? Yes, um, uh, thank you for doing that. I mean, it's really interesting because I worked with BHF uh, some in sort of 2005 onwards to 2009, I've been working uh, on campaigns with BHF. Um, I run a communications uh, agency which specializes in multicultural communication. So it's addressing people who are, where English is not the first language or people who come from a, uh, you know, who are, who are from a different diverse background. So that's, that's where our specialization comes from. Um, and it's very interesting because uh, we were pitching in for a client uh, and Diageo and that we just walked out of the pitch saying that, you know, we don't handle anything which affects the community and stuff. And on that basis, uh, somebody was in that pitch who referred us to BHF. And then when we came, came and shared with the BHF that we uh, see us as an advertising agency, as an ethical advertising agency who wants to do work with uh, something which helps the community. So they were very impressed by our credentials and asked us to work. Um, the story about is, it's very interesting, is that learning a lot, because I was the executive creative director on the campaign, learned a little bit. And I was back home in India, sitting with my mom and my family. And suddenly I realized my mother was having a heart attack. And my uh, brother was insisting who looks after her was that oh she ate uh, uh, 
cauliflower last night, you know, and I think it's it's just that cauliflower. And I, I told her not to eat the cauliflower and she kept on eating. And I said to her, look, I think we need to do something, call somebody in. And uh, after me insisting for about 15, 20 minutes, he got really annoyed and then said, yes, I'll call somebody in, you know. And um, somebody came in and while he did the ECG and then uh, said, yes, she was having a heart attack, you know. Yeah. So um, I'm so lucky by working on the PHF campaign that I have had her for seven years because nothing happened in that because she got treatment and uh, uh, it was a mild heart attack and you know she got treated, you know. So that's that's really my connection with BHF. So I really loved that I should really do something much more for the community because I got that I saved a life and the life of my mother, you know, because that's really yeah. important to me, you know, yeah. Yeah. And the campaign was like encouraging people to call 999. Yes, yes, yes. So, it's, 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 so, yeah, that, campaign, you know. yeah that the campaign which we did was all about how you should actually, when you see the symptoms, don't call your GP, call 999. Because within the Asian community and other ethnic communities, they're very close to their GP. And they have this little thought, oh, I'll get up in the morning, embarrassment because of the family, you know, oh, I can't, you know, yeah. Or I'm living in my mother-in-law's place, so I don't need to do that. And all of these can lead that you don't get that golden hour of treatment. Yeah, yeah so important, that timing. Yeah. yeah. And so you had your first heart attack in 2016. Can you yes. take us back to that day and, and what you started feeling? Yeah, it's interesting because um, I started to feel, which I'm I'm sort of looking at it, that it was a couple of days before I was feeling something not working. Um, and I was thinking it's my unfitness, you know, so I had joined the gym. Um, and it was first thing in the morning, I had my chia seeds and my drink and everything. And I turned up at the gym. And when I was in the gym, I suddenly felt that I shouldn't touch heavy weights because there's something not right with me the way I'm behaving and I got into the shower and I just had my head spin completely uh, and I thought there's something wrong you know and I need to you know so I just walk, walked up and it's just next to my office the gym is downstairs so I went up to the office um, and I sat down and my colleague said something looks wrong just call 999 um, I was asking him to drive me to Chelsea and Westminster, but he said, no, I call 999. And, and I called, they arrived. Um, and then they just said, asked me, what do I do? And I told them, this is an advertising agency. And they thought I was having a panic attack or something. Yeah. So, and I just kept on insisting them that, look, there's something wrong. And my brother just had a stent put in a year before and my father had a heart attack and my mother um, is suffered from heart as well um, and on my insistence you know yeah. they asked me to go to the hospital yeah yeah and they, they did an ECG didn't they which came back normal to begin with yes yes it actually when they did the first time there was it perfectly everything was fine they just just asked me to just relax and that's why they were saying that sit and relax and have a cold water and uh yeah, so that there you go. That was my first heart attack. Yeah. Yeah. And what were you thinking when they were suggesting that it was a panic attack? Um, to an extent, I was like, I hope that it is, you know, yeah, <laughs> because I had I had a little bit of my worry that why is it, you know, yeah, that I'm feeling so bad, you know. So there was there was a concern, uh, but at the same time, um, the pain was becoming more and more, mm -hmm. and I realized that. Uh, the pain was becoming and it was started to move it started yeah. to move yeah. yeah yeah and what happened next when you went into the hospital oh went into the hospital so obviously uh by the time i was in the in the uh, ambulance i was asking them that please give me some medication because the pain is just too much i just couldn't bear my hand my back um so so they took me straight and i realized that it's probably now the attack is just happening so they took me straight mm -hmm. into blue light uh, to chelsea and westminster and i think i would say and it's just amazing and the way they looked after me and the way everything was done uh was really great you know yeah so uh i was really operated with it within that same day yeah okay. yeah yeah and, so, and how did your how did your life change after that first ah uh, uh, i actually 
would say that what I did was I went into a shock, yeah, mm -hmm. um, complete shock. Um, and then uh, I remember from my first heart attack, I didn't go back to work for three months. I started walking as if there was something wrong with me. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, I think I probably aged in that three months uh, the way I was thinking. And I thought my life is like going to finish, you know, yeah. Um, I should think of selling my shares and my business and, you know, thinking. So it's the whole thing was like, I need to like look at retiring. And that is uh, what I was, you know, um, lost weight. But uh, I I would say that, uh, you know, overall, I, I changed my all behavior and stuff. But I was still uh, sort of, I would say the impact on me was a lot because it was like, oh, I have I, I have a heart problem, you know. So that was what I was there, yeah, feeling, yeah, through. That sort of became your identity almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then I know things changed after your second heart attack. So why don't you talk us through what <laughs> so, happened with the second heart attack? Sure. What was going on in your life then? Yeah, I, I think uh, the interesting part is that uh, my second heart attack happened is when I was going through a divorce. So I was a lot of stress in my life. Um, and um, I was, again, back in the office, working in the office. But I, if I start in the morning, so I was I moved out of my house and I was uh, at a friend's place uh, and my brother called me in the morning. And a day before that, I realized that it was a very hot day. First uh, of July 2018 was a very hot day. And I, I thought, OK. I'll clean his living room because it was a bit dirty and I thought I'll help him clean the room, you know, yeah. Um, and took the carpet out. And then the minute I took the carpet out, I lifted the carpet to shake the carpet. And the heat, as if I had a heat stroke, the whole world shifted for me. And for a second, I thought, oh, it's the heat. I shouldn't have gone out on the heat. So I came back, had a bit of ice cream and everything became okay. Uh, but that's how it was. And then in the morning, I got up and I my brother called me and I said to him, the one who has a stent, you know, so he yeah. was concerned about me going through a divorce and a separation sort of, yeah. Uh, and I just couldn't control my, I was crying. I was just crying. My eyes out and he said to me, what's happening? And I said, just don't know. I just feel something is wrong with me. And he said to me, it's your stent. Uh, it's just because of the heat, I feel exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And said, what are you doing? I said, I'm planning to go to the office and I just want to forget or just the air conditioning is in the office. So I'll go there. Turned up at the office. Uh, my team was working on a campaign and I was requested to join in. And I just didn't want to sit in that meeting. Uh, and I just walked out and my colleague looked at me and he thought there's something wrong him walking out of a meeting was wrong. And then I sat down, I thought, I'm going to call 111. Yeah. And, it, and I called them and then I had a chat and said, I have a similar feeling of what I had last time in my attack. And they came in, uh, they did my ECG, everything was okay. You know, <laughs> I was perfectly feeling, they walked me down to, to the uh, ambulance and I walked down to the ambulance. We got into Chelsea and Westminster, it was very busy. They didn't feel that it was such important. They thought they should check me. Yeah. But it took about 45 minutes to do a blood test. And then the, they found out that the triple N was at 3,000 something. Uh, so I could suddenly, they asked me to sit down and, you know. They knew what, that. Yeah, so that's, that's what is happening. But interestingly, it's very interesting is that what is the difference between my first and the second? I really didn't make that this, you know, after the second heart attack, within seven days, I was back to work. I just mm -hmm. decided that uh, I'm going to change my complete life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there was nobody there to wash my clothes and cry at me and say, hey, how are you? <laughs> because I was living in somebody's single, you know, house, you know, I wasn't with my kids and stuff. So I decided I'm going to completely change my wardrobe, my look, my thinking, and and I every day talk to my little heart and say, hey, you're fine. You've given me beautiful time. And you know what? Uh, you've given me beautiful, uh, my, my love for my mother, for my wife, for my ex-wife and, and for my kids. And that's how it is. And I take it very positive. And 
and I and just for men does a good job and I look young and that's how it is you know yeah <laughs> oh I, I love that I love that when you say you talk to your heart and just check in with it make yeah. sure it's yeah. okay it's beautiful yeah so your mindset completely changed after your second heart it, attack. it is it, I mean as like when you called me and wanted to have a chat I had completely because I just go through my routine uh, make sure that I'm I'm exercising. I eat well. Um, I check myself as to what I'm doing. Um, keep my immune up because throughout the pandemic, that was the best thing to do. Keep my immune up. Keep my you know exercise and keep myself positive. Something mm-hmm. which I've really looked at is just be positive. You know, yeah. Look at it that life is that you have a one beautiful life, and then you need to live it. You really need to live. You know and uh, so that's why I recently got married uh, at 60. So Play that's why it is, you know. So, yeah, that what that's what probably brings me much more positive. And I, I bring all the negativity out. You know, I, I just look at it as a beautiful way of looking at people and say they are beautiful human beings, you know. Not look at anybody's negativity, but look at everybody's positivity, you know. And they all have beautiful things, you know. So that's how, yeah. Yeah. I think it's so interesting that it took your, your second heart attack to sort of, shape that thinking yeah um, but yeah I guess it was a blessing in disguise <laughs> yeah you're right you know I, I really think is that uh, from being that victim of my first heart attack to really looking at that's I'm responsible for it mm-hmm. and I need to drop my pressure and everything down yeah and 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 be positive is how I need to look at it that's what I look at it you know now Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for sharing that story. Really, really uplifting one for people who might be experiencing similar things. So thank you so much. And and back to you, Adam. Thank you. Thanks, Javed. Thanks so much for your story. Really, really inspiring story. Really appreciate you taking the time to tell us that story today. Our second speaker today is BHF funded researcher, Professor Nick Mills, who's going to explain a little bit more about personalised medicine and a new artificial intelligence tool to diagnose heart attacks faster that Nick's working on at the moment. Over to you, Nick. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Just give me a second and I'll get my slides um, shared. That was a really interesting story, Javid. Thank you for sharing it. Um, Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, participate uh, in this. I... I will tell you a little bit about my background and why I think personalized medicine is really important, specifically in this area. Uh, And I'm going to focus a little bit to align with Javid's story on how we can use personalized medicine to help us uh, improve the diagnosis uh, of heart attacks. Um, My perspective uh, comes from here um, uh, in many ways. I spent a lot of my time going in and out of this entrance to the cath lab, putting in stents to treat people with heart attacks. Uh, this is also my bike. I spent a lot of time on that too. Uh, and I like taking pictures. So if you're not that interested in personalized medicine, then hopefully I can choose some nice pictures of my bike in Scotland. Um, <laughs> and, but I have another uh, uh, two roles that I shape my thinking on personalized medicine here. Uh, one, uh, over the last 20 years, in partnership with the British Heart Foundation, lots of these lovely people, uh, I have been working on trying to uh, understand how we can improve diagnosis and care uh, for people with acute cardiac conditions so that they have better outcomes. And uh, in my uh, third role, I work on a program uh, with the UK and Scottish government called Data Driven Innovation. Um, in order to deliver personalized medicine, we're going to need uh, reliable data that is representative of all the different people that we uh, care for uh, in an acute cardiac setting. Uh, and so our challenge with this new program is to bring together the, the people uh, that are going to be able to make these data-driven solutions work for our health and care system. Um, now, Personalized medicine is actually pretty simple. Um, It's getting the right treatment to the right person uh, and it's understanding how they're going to respond to that treatment by taking into consideration their uh, circumstance. And in this uh, short talk, I'm gonna cover four areas 
specifically are around heart attacks. Uh, what is our current state of the art diagnosis and, and care for, for someone with a heart attack? What are the big challenges that we face today? How can personalized medicine solve some of those challenges? And lastly, what do I think the future might look like if we can harness data to drive uh, personalized uh, care and decisions in the future? Um, but I'm gonna start a little bit with some history, if that's okay, because uh, state of the art today is delivered in a coronary care unit. It might not look exactly like this anymore. Uh, and I don't normally uh, start my talks with a uh, photograph of a patient, but this uh, particular patient uh, gave permission for his uh, photograph to be on the front page of the Edinburgh Evening News uh, over 60 years ago. Uh, and that was when the first coronary care unit was created uh, and it was in Edinburgh. So this is where I started my training. Um, and it looked pretty similar when I was training. Um, but the, the concept behind the coronary care unit is a really important one. So people who come into hospital with chest pain, chest discomfort, breathlessness, possibly a heart attack, prior to this period of time, were admitted to lots of different places all over the hospital. And of course, um, heart attacks can uh, be complicated by serious complications and therefore uh, time is of the essence, as Javid already mentioned. Um, and so this very simple invention, which was of the coronary care unit, meant that everyone went to the same place. They all got access to diagnostic testing rapidly. They got treatment rapidly. And actually just the creation of a coronary care unit uh, improves survival from a heart attack by 20% after it was introduced into clinical practice. Not all of the ideas that came from Edinburgh have been so successful, by the way. So this is the 1970s where we piloted um, the first ever mobile coronary care unit. The idea was to take the coronary care unit out to the patient. It looked like it was tremendous fun, but uh, never really caught on um, to where we are today. And uh, Javid uh, was understating some of the contributions he's made to BHF over the years and uh, his um, campaign uh, to uh, encourage people from different backgrounds, different communities to think about heart disease, uh, along with other BHF campaigns that have been vitally important. We're not taking minis out to people in the community. We have a very efficient uh, system now, 0999, an ambulance will bring you to the, the right hospital to get the treatment as quick as possible. And as a consequence of the success of these campaigns, we now see almost a million people each year in our emergency departments across the UK uh, with symptoms of possible heart attack. That is the most common presentation to hospital. Fortunately, less than one in 10 people are actually having a heart attack, but that's okay, that is fine. Uh, we want to see people, we want to uh, try and work out who needs care uh, urgently and who does not. Um, but it does create some, uh, some challenges for us. And you might think that the diagnosis of heart attack is pretty straightforward. Um, and actually, across the world, we all agree on what the criteria should be to diagnose a heart attack. And it's based on some very simple uh, features. So the history. Um, I don't think we're that much better at understanding each other's description of symptoms than we were 100 years ago. But it's a really important part of the diagnosis. The electrocardiogram. Again, this is a test we've been using in clinical practice for almost 100 years. Vitally important, but not very sensitive. But there has been huge innovation in the art today now around the use of blood tests, biomarkers, and imaging tests to see the heart better to make the diagnosis. Uh, and, and the gold standard, uh, if you're having a heart attack today, remains uh, an X-ray of the heart involved, involving putting catheter up to the heart to inject the dye to see the clot, causing the problem. Um, but we've been doing some uh, important studies trying to introduce newer technologies that are easier to deliver in local hospitals and for patients that don't involve these invasive procedures, including CT scans of the heart. And I hope you'll agree the image on the right shows uh, the heart arteries just as beautifully as the old fashioned tests that we've been using for since 1970s. Um, we also have amazing technologies and tools now that really, if there is uncertainty, you can see right into the artery to understand what's going on in the heart, uh, to, to identify that clot that's caused the problem. 
uh, using MRI scans, you know, clinical imaging. But of course, these tests are uh, complicated and difficult to deliver and not available everywhere. Uh, and therefore, simpler tests, such as blood tests, uh, are often used as the kind of initial assessment and diagnosis. And this is vitally important because we need to identify those that would benefit from these more complex tests. Uh, and cardiac troponin, uh, I think Javid mentioned, is a, a really important test because it tells us when the heart is under stress or is injured. Uh, it's a very uh, specific protein that's only released from heart muscle uh, when, when it is injured. Uh, and it has been transformative in, in our diagnostic practice uh, in the UK. Um, but we've moved from uh, a, a period of time where we, we, we set relatively arbitrary thresholds to, to diagnose a heart attack um, because we didn't really know how to use this test to having very, very sensitive tests that allow us now to measure injury to the heart, even in people that aren't having a heart attack, so that we can define what truly is normal and what is abnormal in order to make the diagnosis more precisely. Um, what I think probably one of the, the most important bits of research that we've done in this uh, space was uh, uh, around eight, eight, nine years ago, when we first got access to these very sensitive tests uh, and understood what normal was, because we suddenly realized that normal was different in men and women. Um, and and to, to that point, we used a, a single uh, a diagnostic threshold for a heart attack for men and women. Uh, and, and in a very simple study, we were able to demonstrate that if we were to apply a different, uh, different criteria for men and women, we would uh, increase the recognition of heart disease in women uh, and try and address one of the long-standing biases in acute cardiac care, which has been the under-recognition of heart disease in women. Of course, it's not as simple as just sex. Now, we'll come back to that a little bit when we talk a bit more about why I think we need a personalized approach. We also recognize that this test was extremely helpful for risk stratification. So uh, if you come to the emergency department and have a heart attack ruled out, we can now get insights into what the future might hold for you uh, using this uh, test. Uh, and I've developed really, uh, I think, very effective pathways that are now endorsed by NICE and ruled out across uh, the emergency departments in the UK to help us uh, really uh, guide uh, what needs to happen next. So that's where we are today. Um, and that isn't really personalized medicine. If you accept that, that we now recognize that men and women are different, how do we um, go beyond that? Um, and what, what, what are the existing challenges? And I'm gonna just say that um, having spent 10 years trying to define how we should use these tests in clinical practice, I've come to the conclusion that actually um, no one approach is perfect. Um, they're all wrong, in fact. Um, because they're not individualized, they're not personalized. And the, the, the more sensitive you make a test, the less specific it becomes. Uh, and we try and apply criteria that are derived from the average person to an individual person. And I'm just going to give you one example of why this really doesn't work all that well. Um, and, and if I take the guidelines that we have, the international guidelines on how to use diagnostic tests for heart attack and apply them, to people across different ages, what you'll see is that the performance of the test is excellent if you're very young. It's very good at ruling in or ruling out a heart attack, but as you get older, it gets less effective. And that is because different uh, other different conditions can influence the heart and influence the result of these tests. So the performance is not consistent uh, across age. Uh, and on the right, the detail doesn't matter, but hopefully you'll just see that the, there is a sc random scatter uh, of the performance of this test across people with different uh, underlying heart conditions. So if you have a problem with your kidneys, if you have diabetes, if you've already got heart disease when you come into hospital, we can't apply the same approach. So here's a great opportunity for personalized medicine, I think, to really provide uh, a equal care for everyone and trying to make sure we get the diagnosis of a heart attack right every time. Uh, so. What is it going to look like? Well, um, we've made a couple of attempts at this, uh, and I'll be clear, we didn't get it right at the beginning. Um, our first attempt to use this, and I, I think one of the questions in the chat already is about artificial intelligence. 
um, was to use an artificial intelligence algorithm using a form of computational modeling called machine learning, which takes your age when you arrive in the emergency department, your sex, and it takes the results of the test and it tries to individualize whether you've had a heart attack or not. It calculates the probability uh, of whether your uh, presentation was a heart attack or, or not. Um, the challenge is that they didn't work. Uh, so we did this work in a very small study of people who had consented into uh, a research study, and they aren't always representative of everyone we see in practice. The differences in ethnicity, age, complicated uh, other health problems that might preclude someone wanting to volunteer for a research study uh, means that, uh, that the sorts of people that we see in this practice sometimes don't aren't representative. And what we found was that the, the tool just didn't work when we applied it in our day-to-day -day practice. So we started again, start from scratch. And this time we used uh, routinely collected data from multiple hospitals that gave us a really representative look at the sort of people that came into our hospitals with chest pain and possible heart attack. Half were women. The average age was 70, and that is true for the people that we see in our emergency department. And we trained this uh, model, uh, which gives exactly the same information, a probability about whether you've had a heart attack. And then we worked together with uh, seven different countries around the world to validate that to determine whether it would perform consistently in countries with different ethnic uh, populations uh, uh, and different healthcare systems. Uh, and this time we seem to have done better uh, in that we are seeing more consistent performance, better performance to try and reduce inequalities in the use of these tests for diagnosing a heart attack. We also have improved efficiency. So um, this is important, I think, for the health service, which is under pretty considerable pressure um, from lots of different uh, reasons. But by using probabilities, we can identify people who are, are very unlikely to have a heart attack right at the time of arrival without having to admit them to hospital to do multiple follow-up tests in order to avoid unnecessary admissions to hospital, which I think are just as important to patients as they are to the, to the NHS, uh, as well as improving the ability to rule in a heart attack by identifying people who are high probability. So I think personalized medicine, um, using the diagnostic tests that we have for heart disease, um, by combining that information with things that are personal to you about your past history or other aspects of your health, will reduce inequality, giving us consistent diagnostic uh, performance in people of different ages, uh, sexes, ethnic groups, uh, in those with and without other conditions, such as diabetes, which is very common, um, and it will improve the efficiency of our healthcare system um, and allow us to tailor our pathways more effectively for patients. I'm not going to pretend that person implementing personalized medicine into the NHS is going to be super easy. Um, we need to uh, do some work on education uh, and training to get people to think about probabilities to guide care rather than considering everything to be binary, it's a positive or a negative. Um, there's always an explainability and trust element when it comes to using models, uh, com computational models, rather than uh, um, individual lab results. And we also need to recognize that in integrating probabilistic decision support tools across the NHS is challenging. Uh, and we need to work on how to deliver that. Um, before I um, open up to questions on the topic, uh, I, I thought I would just uh, show you my view um, uh, from the new building that is uh, getting built as we speak for data-driven innovation. I think the future for the health service for, for heart disease diagnosis, for tailoring treatments uh, will, will need to be uh, data-driven uh, we will need to be, uh, develop more personalized approaches. Um, in order to achieve that, we need to think carefully about how we use uh, the tests that we have and uh, the data that we collect as part of the health service uh, to improve our care pathways. 
And just a couple of things just to think about for the future. So this is a, an ECG, an electrocardiogram. Uh, Willem Eindhoven was given the Nobel Prize for developing this test over 100 years ago, a Dutch physiologist. Uh, and today it's used all over the world in much the same format that he did, did develop it. But today it tells us what's happening right now about your heart. The use of neural networks and artificial intelligence will go beyond diagnosis and start providing insights about the future. Um, it, these tests will also become directly available to patients. Um, you'll no longer have to go and ask a healthcare practitioner to do your ECG. You can do it yourself um, and get those insights, not just about today, but about the future. So we really need to think carefully about how uh, we're going to incorporate these really invaluable uh, opportunities to help patients. Fundamentally, I think we need to use the data that we harness through the assessment of patients with acute cardiac conditions every day in a much more joined up way across the health service. And this is just a map of the data infrastructure that we have built in Scotland in order to um, use de-identified information about people that use our services in a way that helps us to develop pathways for the future. I happen to be responsible for the data service in South East Scotland, which is called Data Law. Uh, but there are four in Scotland and they've just announced 200 million pounds of funding across England to set up similar infrastructure. But it's really important because if we're gonna develop services, personalized services for people with heart conditions, we need to know uh, how common these conditions are, who has them, and what parts of the health service do they interact. And this is just an example of 1.2 million people living in our region, uh, stratified according to age, about how common heart disease is. Uh, and it is extremely common. So this isn't just a, a small challenge. This is a big challenge for us in the health service as to how we can improve uh, and develop more data-driven care uh, and diagnostic approaches that incorporate personalized medicine uh, into practice. Uh, and lastly, this data infrastructure enables us to understand the impact of these personalized approaches and to care. And this isn't, uh, I'm sorry to say, the results of deploying the tool I've just described to you into practice. I hope it will be if you invite me back in a year or two's time, that by harnessing routinely collect the data, um, the implementation of this more sensitive blood test allowed us to reduce time and spend in the emergency department by over three hours uh, and avoid hospital admission uh, in over 50% of people uh, without any risk to patients who did not come back with further cardiac problems in the subsequent year. And by using the state infrastructure across Scotland, we were able to, to, to determine that in just over 31,000 consecutive patients to really understand how data-driven care can directly impact on our health service. Um, so I will um, wrap up. Uh, I think personalized medicine, harnessing routinely collected data in order to develop these tools definitely is the future for acute cardiac conditions and how we uh, tailor both the diagnosis, but also subsequently the treatment. And in the future, these data sets might well incorporate genetics, but that's not ready for today in the health service. Um, and uh, I would also like to thank the British Heart Foundation, who have been a long-term collaborator and partner of ours up in Scotland, along with all the, the super people that have done some of this research. Uh, I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you so much, Nick. Really interesting presentation. It's great to, to kind of reflect back on the history of you know, where we've come from in terms of the diagnosis of heart attacks and then think forward in, in terms of where artificial intelligence might take us. And yeah, thank you for explaining so many complex issues in a way in which we can all understand. I found that absolutely fascinating. Um, we're now going to be joined by all our speakers, um, along with Regina uh, Giblin, our senior cardiac nurse. Um, so we're here to answer all your questions as part of this Q&A. And we've got lots of interesting questions coming in. If you've got any questions, please um, type them into the, the question and answer um, section. So first of all, we've got a, a couple of questions for Javid. Um, sure. People are interested, Javid, in you know what changes did, did you make that were different? Um, 
you know, the second after the second heart attack compared to the first heart attack. And also people asking sort of how do you stay so positive as well? I think that that's really great. You know, I mean, these both the questions, I think um, the first heart attack, I think um, you really, I mean, I, though I knew a lot about heart attack because I worked uh, on the BHF campaign. So you actually did a lot of understanding of uh, the symptoms and how it is and, you know, what is angina to, you know, uh, especially within the Southeast Asians, because I understood mm -hmm. a lot about the arteries and what's happening and stuff. So uh, coming up with the creative. So, um, so that's probably the thing. And I think probably that was a little bit scary for me as well. But I mean, that's what has happened to me. Too much knowledge sometimes mm -hmm. makes you think more than rather than, looking at you know so what i would say to people is between the first and the second was is that i that's the the the, the negative stuff which i built in was that it it was also that uh, i had people around me were scared my kids got a little bit scared you know yeah uh, i'm the dad you know I, i'm the breadwinner in the, in the family you know they were you know from 13 14 and 17 and 19 and you know so, so they were quite young in terms of how they were looking at it you know um so that's that's something and i was really concerned that how would i be you know i'm, I'm the breadwinner and i want to really make sure that uh the business i'm running um and what i really also realized is that uh is that i started doing some some sort of uh personal sort of going through is what i call is uh um, I started coaching. So I went through a personal, a complete thing about uh, learning how my mind is and stuff to be positive. So it was a little bit of that, which I did. But what I really started concentrating is getting up early in the morning uh, and then focusing myself, doing something which I will do, like have my breakfast, be present to it, you know, like like sit in the garden and be positive you know this is what I started doing I realized more in the second one you know the first one I was doing but I was still the fear was too much you know I let the fear run my my life rather than me being in control of it you know so I mean I'm more in control of myself because I feel is that uh, uh, it's it's something which has happened but you know that's what's happened but what you need to do is that uh, you know take your medication on time and I can see that I have probably when I look at it that uh, I had my son brought me this little medicine thing, which is Monday to Friday or Saturday, Sunday. So I, I know which medicine I'm taking. Yeah. And I make sure that I take the medication on time. Um, and if there is any uh, issue or if I feel that there's a pain or something, I just go straight to the 999 or I'll go straight to, you know, for help, you know. So that has been something positive about me. So knowing myself has been much more better for me, you know, yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Javid. It's really, yeah, it's really interesting um, to hear a little bit more about your experience there. Thank you. We've got a couple of questions about troponin. Um, I don't know if uh, Professor Mills or Regina want to take these off. They both want to answer. But there's, there's one question about how quickly um, do we get troponin results? And then there's also about is the level relevant to the se severity of the heart attack and the likely recovery time? That's great questions. Uh, I'm happy to take, take them. Um, I, uh, troponin tests um, are, are currently mainly done in a central laboratory and therefore are only available in big hospitals. Um, but actually there are, are new uh, point of care tests uh, that are, have just recently been launched uh, that can uh, allow you a bit like di diabetic sometimes use finger prick tests for glucose monitoring that might make these tests much more rapidly available within a few minutes um, uh, closer to where people are. Um, we don't yet know how to use those, but you know I, I think it will become much more widely available. Right now, from the moment of arrival in the emergency department, by the time the result of that first test come back, uh, it is around about two hours. Um, it, it should be quicker. Um, and, uh, you know, I think with the rollout of these sorts of point of care technology, we might be able to do it quicker in, in the future. And and at the point of the, those tests, is it is it possible to diagnose the severity of, of a heart attack yeah. based on the, the levels? Y yes and no. 
uh, unfortunately, the actual concentration doesn't uh, uh, tell you a, a huge amount uh, about how important the underlying heart condition is. You can have very small rise of troponin and have very severe underlying coronary heart disease. Um, but if it's abnormal, and by abnormal with personalized medicine, I mean not your normal value, and that would be ideal to know, mm -hmm. uh, then you know something has changed. Um, of course, if you have extensive injury and a big heart attack, and usually those sorts of heart attacks, we don't even need troponin to diagnose because it's mm -hmm. so obvious on the electrocardiogram, uh, then the, the, the greater the injury to the heart, the, the, the more damage that has been ensued. Mm -hmm. But in the majority of people who don't have that type of heart attack, uh, the troponin value doesn't often tell you that much about the extent of disease, which is why we need to bring imaging and other things together to help really uh, understand the nature of your heart disease. No, that's great. That's really good. great questions about uh, troponin as well there. And another good question, which I think is probably for, for you as well, Nick, is there a difference between personalised medicine and mm. precision medicine, which are two um, terms we, we both hear a little bit about now? Yeah, I, it's a good question. Um, I think precision medicine, people often refer more to the targeting of drug treatment based on your genetic profile. Um, but it, it's usually um, the use of many, 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 many different biomarkers or genetic uh, information to try and tailor um, who's going to respond better to, to, to a different medication. At least that's how I often consider precision medicine. It's about the use of um, omics and uh, different biomarkers. Whereas personalized medicine, I think, is something we should all practice all the time based on the information and the tests that we have available. It's about trying to make sure we give the, rather than just following a pathway or a, a guideline that we tailor um, the recommendations and the treatments and, and the results of tests to that individual. So personalized medicine is happening today and it, or it should happen today. Uh, precision medicine is a really important area of research. And I do think in the future, once wide, wider use of genetic testing is available, we will be able to tailor even better our treatments through precision medicine. Right now, uh, it, it remains very much a, a kind of research area. Great, thank you. Um, and just just jump in if you've got anything anything to add as well, Regina. Okay, uh, next question. Um, this one's for Jarvid again. Oh. Thanks again for telling your story. How did your support system, such as your family and friends, play a role in the recovery process for you? Interesting. I think uh, be, being um, coming from a nation background, you have a massive family. I mean, I have seven brothers and three sisters, you know, so I've come from a big family setup, you know, yeah. And I think that's really important uh, uh, for the family to actually be with you. Um, uh, I think in the first heart attack when it happened, I, my kids, my ex-wife was quite supportive of the whole thing, you know, in terms of how, how it has been. It's important. I think uh, the family is a really key thing. I get um, that when I was sort of separated, you know, I was living separate, you know, and, and I had a second heart attack, you know, my entire family who lives worldwide everywhere, everybody used to call me, and especially during COVID, you know, it was it was the best thing that I, I developed. I, I started the first family group of my great grandfather. So I, I created a whole uh, sort of a group between so everybody talked to, to each other. So I think communication within family is really great. Yeah. And I think it's important that we should share and talk about it. You know, sometimes within the Asians, they don't talk about and people mm -hmm. that's not really nice. You know, people, uh, you know you need to sometimes release and have a conversation because somebody else might be having a similar experience. Yeah. I'm really coming here to share because I feel is that with my sharing, could I be able to help one person? And if one person can actually be saved in this conversation, you know, yeah. Or people might look at it, you know, it'll be great. And I think that's important. And I think uh, mm. the habit of keeping things inside is not good for your positiveness as well, because you're not sharing it. But if you have a conversation with somebody in your family or find yourself a, a mentor or a cousin or somebody who listens, you know, yeah, who just listens, it's really great to have that. Yeah. So for me, I think that really works is that just picking up and having a chat with somebody and being saying that, OK, this is how it went through in your life, because if you share about your life, then I think uh, 
you you get out of it you get out of your head you know that's probably what what works with me you know great no great advice thank you thank you for sh sharing that um we've got a couple of questions for nick about what do you see as the main challenges going forward in terms of personalized medicine and the barriers for making this type of care more commonplace um i think it's we've been used to um considering things in a, a rather binary fashion and certainly in, in terms of some tests uh so uh, I, I think the education involved around understanding uncertainty and probability is is a, a key piece uh, but i also think that the way our health systems are set up um doesn't make it easy to deploy um AI tools mm -hmm. within the NHS currently. And I think that that needs a bit of investment and in thinking about how we can really simply introduce these sorts of tools into the workflow so that it's easy for people to use them. Because it has to be very easy. And I showed you a little picture of a mobile phone. We have a mobile phone app, but absolutely do not want people using their mobile phone to diagnose heart attacks. It should be embedded into the, 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 the hospital systems. And that requires uh really the, the health service to embrace these sorts of tools and technologies to, to introduce them into practice I, the, the, the truth though is once you've done it once or for one condition or one pathway it becomes very easy to apply it to many other different conditions and i think things will really accelerate in this area pretty quickly over mm -hmm. the next few years yeah great uh question um from Canada and nurse regina now the question is, if I was to contact BHF's heart helpline, how personalised would the information be that I'd receive about my health condition? What a great question. Well, firstly, we would say we welcome the phone call. Um, it's important that people reach out, uh, especially in times at the moment when in the NHS at the moment, it's hard to get hold of one of your specialists or one of the cardiac nurses. Uh, we are a specialised team of cardiac nurses with lots of experience. We all worked in the NHS. Some of it has some, some counselling background. Basically, the, the personal side of it, though, we will listen to your story. You can tell us all about your symptoms. You can tell, tell us about your diagnosis. We can, we can talk to you and reassure you about your symptoms and also about any tests you've had done when you explain the tests. We can speak to your relatives and, and give off them re uh, reassurance. And sometimes, as, as Javid mentioned earlier, sometimes people just want to talk. And that's OK as well, you know, just to have a chat with us about what they're worried about. And also we can we can offer some information and support and maybe steer them in the right direction about questions they can ask in their next appointment and, and just things like that. And, and we can also send them a follow up email if needs be, if they want more information from our website. And uh, we do welcome the calls. We can do emails, phone calls. We also have um, a chat service as well. So we can do that so people can contact us in any, in any way. And also there is Health Unlocked, which is a peer to peer support forum that people can share their experiences and that can really offer support to people as well great thank you thank you for that and then one final question which is you know i think a tough question regina but someone's asked how can i improve my cardiovascular health in general and reduce the risk of, of future heart attacks what would you say to that as a, as a cardiac nurse i would say um that we we'll firstly look at their individual risk factors to the, the reasons why they may have developed the, the um, heart disease. Um, but also the first thing that sprung to my mind was cardiac rehabilitation. I think exercise is wonderful and really does help people and um, getting that support and information from, you know, a cardiac rehabilitation class, if there's one available, there are online programs as well, but it really does help people get their confidence back. And also they have that nurse there who can look at the risk factors and help them with their lifestyle changes, such as eating healthily, stop smoking, thinking about alcohol consumption, um, attending their appointments whenever they happen, and also trying to take the medication as prescribed, um, which is quite important as well. Um, so there's quite a few things you can do for yourself, but I think the overall thing, positive mental attitude is great because I think that really helps people to move on and to live after having heart disease because there's plenty to live for and there's plenty more research out there to support you and lots of more developments. So, you know, if anyone has heart problems, there is a future. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone who's 
submitted questions. Um, if we haven't managed to get to your questions today, they would encourage you to, to contact our help, helpline um, and contact our, our dedicated, dedicated clinical team um, with, any, with any of your queries. And yeah, apologies if we've not got to everyone's questions. I'd just like to wrap up by thanking everyone for watching this edition of Live and Ticking. We hope you've enjoyed hearing from all our brilliant speakers. I've, I've really enjoyed listening um, to you all. It's been really, really interesting. Um, before we wrap up, I'd just like you to answer one final poll question, which is how would you rate your understanding of personalised medicine now? And again, rate that on a scale of one to five, with one being, you know, having very little or no understanding of personalised medicine to five, having a, a great deal of understanding about personalised medicine. So we'd really appreciate if everyone could just take a couple of seconds to answer that question again, please. Thank you. And just to say again, thank you to you know all our participants and, and, and Professor Mills for presenting his research. All our incredible research is funded 100% by you, the public. Um, that's what powers the British Heart Foundation. Um, if you've been inspired by some of the amazing science you've heard about today and the opportunities it presents for the future, then all your donations to, to support our life-saving work, you know, we, will always be greatly appreciated um, there's a link to donate um, and you can go to the BHF website um, if you'd like to donate to support the BHF so thank you um, for all your support um, we'd also encourage feedback on these events live and ticking is a monthly webinar series so we strive to produce the best events every single month um, your feedback and comments are crucial to help us plan and develop future events so we ask if you can complete the survey at the end to provide any feedback and this will inform future events and you can receive emails um, and notifications in the future. Um, this event was recorded and will be available on the YouTube channel like all our live and ticking events. Um, and our next event will take place on the 26th, 26th of July. And the topic for that event is how sleep affects your heart. Um, and we'll post a link to how you can register for that. So I hope that you'll join again next month. And thanks again. Thanks to all our, all our panel and speakers today. Thanks again for joining us. Goodbye.